1934, long before anyone even knew what an eco-terrorist was, a WPA crew working that same area vanished without a trace. Not one of those men was ever found or heard from again. And you suspect what? Bigfoot? Not likely. That's a lot of flannel to be choking down, even for Bigfoot. Come on, Scully, it'll be a nice trip to the forest. Discovering the X-Files, the podcast in which a newbie, that's me, takes a deep dive into the entirety of Chris Carter's creepy universe as longtime fans escort me on the journey, a journey filled with paranoid conspiracies and monsters of the week. I'm Eric's Antoine, and today Daniel and I will be discussing Darkness Falls, which originally aired in the U.S. on April 15th, 1994. It was written by Chris Carter and directed by Joe Napolitano. In this episode, Mulder and Scully investigate the disappearance of loggers in the wilderness of the Pacific Northwest. It is not the work of eco-terrorists, as most believe, but rather caused by an ancient menace lurking in the woods. This Monster of the Week episode has a couple of terrific guest stars. There's Titus Welliver as a suspected eco-terrorist, And the other guest actor is a wonderful actor, whose name is, I think, Jason Beggy, or, or Beg, or Begay, or, I mean, why didn't his agent just tell him to change his fucking name? No offense, Jason, you're a wonderful actor, I just don't know how to pronounce your fucking name. Anyway, after the break, Daniel and I are going to talk about that, and the episode as a whole. So, stick around. What happened here? We're camped two valleys over. Four of us. Three now. It's more than a day's hike. No way we want to be caught out in the forest after dark. You don't want to go out in the night. Take my word on that. It's out there. What? I go out that door, somebody's going to attack me, eat me alive, and spin me in his web? Yes. What, it's too polite to come in here and get me? For some reason, it's, uh, it's afraid of the light. It's afraid of the light. There may be something to what he's saying, Steve. You know what I think? I think this man is a liar and a murderer and just clever enough to make up a story like that. And I'm going to prove I'm right. So, you know, uh, l- last time, uh, there was a, it was a, an, a fascinating look or, or a glimpse of the, uh, w- with certain air of authenticity of, like, the, the Native American community. Mm-hmm. And so this time we have a a compelling look at the lumberjack uh, industry, or, you know, or the, the the lumberjack trade, the logging industry, so to speak. Um, I thought it was interesting. The, the like, you know, so so this is this is an episode called Darkness Falls. And uh, before we talk about the episode itself, uh, I think it bears mentioning that there is a probably forgotten but you'd know because like you're, mm-hmm. you're 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 well versed in this uh it's a it's a forgotten horror film from the early aughts with that title and i'm pretty sure it was directed but was it directed by like scott derrickson or jonathan or, Liebesman? <laughs> jonathan Liebesman. all right it was I, I knew it was one of those guys one of those like you know ha- had that sort of middling career and unfortunately jonathan Liebesman didn't get a big break he didn't get to direct like a marvel movie or anything like that but uh or, or did he did what well, did he do something like big at some point he did one of the ninja turtle movies the the newer oh. reboot films he's okay he's kind of a mostly a journeyman really mm. he also did the uh the prequel to the texas chainsaw massacre remake oh right okay so yeah he did eventually do slightly more upscale stuff i suppose upscale you know in quotes um, and what, what I meant was that, like, I don't remember much of that movie. I know that I did see it. But the only thing that I do remember is that, like, a lot of movies from that period, this is, what, 2003, 2004, something like that. Mm-hmm. And, like, a lot, of, a lot of movies from that period 
and I, I get that they all had sort of the same problem where they were, they always had like interesting ideas and like this creepy atmosphere, this creepy atmosphere. And then at the end, you have this monster, this CGI monstrosity that shows up at the end of the thing and completely just, in my opinion, fucks the movie. Cause it's like, okay, well this, this stopped being scary the moment that thing showed up on screen. I, it was kind of like that, right? Wasn't it like this big yeah, black yeah. monster that just kind of uh, shows up? It was one of those films where they shot the movie. Of course, the villain of the film is a witch that was burned at the stake and comes back as the tooth fairy to come and snatch away <laughs> children and devour them in the night if they're peeking when the tooth fairy <laughs> comes to take their tooth. Good concept. In yeah, fact, you yeah. could do an X-Files episode out of it. I could easily see Mulder walking in, tossing a file on Scully's desk and say, do you ever hear about <laughs> the witch Matilda Dixon? Yeah, it, it's a forgettable early aughts horror movie it's not terrible but it's nothing particularly memorable but the reason i always remember it is because at the end at the end when you finally see the tooth fairy it's just an old burnt up hag kind of floating around in the air nothing particularly memorable but when they shot it they had a full creature that they replaced later in post-production they got far enough along in development that mcfarland's movie maniacs line did a toy of the original design so I have it, kind of yeah. a gargoyle esque. They should have stuck with that. <laughs> so okay, so what so what you're saying is that they had an original design, original concept, and they they shot they did, with, yeah. They shot with it. So what they shot with was practical. Uh, for the most part, yes. And then okay. they replaced it later. With a CGI, it. with with a CGI bullshit thing. Like it wasn't <laughs> reshoots. They just sort of, wow. Well, that's unfortunate. What was that? Because of the test screening. Probably, or I'm not sure what studio made it, but I'm sure some sort of producer belly ached about it. Okay, then. Well, yeah. Uh, but anyway, that's enough about that. Let's talk about Darkness Falls. <laughs> Darkness Falls, the X Files episode, which, I mean, much like the movie we just talked about, like the the plot of this episode could very easily have been the plot of a horror movie. Oh yeah. It, it's it's basically a a monster movie, if you will. There, there even is like a monster movie from like the seventies with Michael Caine about killer bees, right? The swarm or something swarm, like that. Yeah. Where, there was a couple you know, of them like that. Right. Or, you know, a uh, phase four about the, well, yeah. that's giant, that's giant ants. But, but, um, but in any case, the, the thing, this is just, Kingdom these are the just <laughs> Kingdom of the Spiders. Um, I mean, the list goes, arachnophobia, the list goes on and on. But my point is that like the concept of what is this killer termites, um, Killer lightning bugs. Yeah, killer lightning bugs. Uh, it's 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 a good concept for a horror movie. So this gets points for that right off the bat. I think that even though I couldn't give two shits about the logging industry, and maybe this was more quote unquote topical in 1994 mm -hmm. uh, when the episode aired, the, because there's that whole thing. I mean, Titus Welliver. Is like a Greenpeace type dude, right? Uh, you know, he's a, an, an eco terrorist. And I guess something about that sort of feels topical, I guess, for 94. Because even that stuff always showed up in genre films. They, I think it, it's like an Armageddon or something that it starts with some Greenpeace like boat and the, the oil workers start like, you know, shitting on them or whatever so Rick the thing Willis is like hits golf balls at him yeah exactly so like so it's it was sort of a thing that yeah it's this is the this is the mid 90s and you know we, we still have the luxury of, of of making fun of people like that because bill clinton is president um no so so so, so here's the thing like i do think that it has a really good concept but I, i'd be curious to I'd, I'd like to throw it over to you like what, what do you think of this episode overall well, our last episode, it was a werewolf movie. And this one, we've got the Nature Run Amok film, little 70s subgenre action going on there. So I like that aspect of it. All you would have to do would be to remove the modern elements of the beginning and end, and you could have set this in the 70s. It would have been fine because they're just up in the woods. But what I really like about the fact that, yes, it's tackling the logging industry, but it tackles it from three different directions with our three featured players. You have the the boss of the company who's terminally pissed off at everyone around him. 
and just itching to pull that shotgun trigger on Titus Welliver when he shows up later on. And then you have Titus Welliver as the tree-hugging uh, eco-terrorist who will wreak havoc on all of your engines with uh, <laughs> rice and sugar. <laughs> and then you have the forest ranger who's just kind of caught in the middle and seems utterly irritated with the both of them. He's there to put order, you know? Yeah. So he's going to do his job. But he doesn't... He doesn't really side with either of them. He's kind of neutral yeah. in the thing where, because he he actually says no. He he does say that he sympathizes with um with the cause. Right. You know he he's sort of against the idea of them cutting down protected trees and, and whatnot. But he just he just says well, but you know once they go too far, once they're like, once they step into an avenue where they're breaking the law, then you know I I can't just stand by that right. So right. So that by doing that he's kind of, I mean he's a likable character, but. When, when he presents himself that way. He's not antagonistic. He's just a cop doing his job. So I have a question for you before we get mm-hmm. into the rest of this episode. Sure. Did you, like me, spend at least 15 minutes on Google today trying to figure out how to finally pronounce the Forest Ranger actor's name? No, I didn't bother. Um, <laughs> but I do know, that if you know, you're going to tell me the answer. But uh, I really uh, don't know. <laughs> okay, no, I, I don't. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's Jason, and uh, you know, uh, I, I record my intros and outros after the fact, mm-hmm. so I'm pretty sure that the intro that played before this episode it consists of me butchering his name if I bother to mention him at all. But he's the guy from Monkey Shines, right? Yeah, Monkey Shines and Californication. Right, he was and on there for a stretch as well. Well, because, yeah, I, w- I was looking that up on Wikipedia. He apparently is like a childhood friend of David Duchovny's. Yeah. And he's sort of like, I mean, you know, I guess they went to acting school together or whatever. So they're like buddies. They're best friends. That's an interesting detail. But he's a really good actor, actually. Yeah. And I, I, I don't I always like him. Yeah, he's got like this intensity. He's kind of like a kind of like a proto kind of like a proto Michael Shannon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can you know, I, I'm just going to like. He's got that same energy, that 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 same sort of intensity, and you. He's got great chemistry with the company because, like, his scenes with the company are really charged. And I mean, basically, what, what I'm getting at by saying that is that he. God, yeah. How do you pronounce his fucking name? No, anyway, but um. I think it's supposed to be the gay, but I'm not positive on that. But it's Jason B E G H E. If for right, anyone so, listening that doesn't know who we're talking about. Yeah, so it's either Begay or Beggy or Bech, Beige, who knows? But uh, the point is, he's a good actor. No, but that's that's the thing. This this episode also one of the good qualities that it definitely has is that it's very well acted. Oh yeah, it's one of the examples of where this you know a couple of weeks ago we were ranking on them getting a really shitty guest actor, but in this particular case, no, they they got they got very solid. Obviously not, not you know, Titus Welliver was basically nobody back then, mm-hmm. but uh, but it doesn't matter. He's a really good character actor who was, like, showing up in a lot of TV. And they have this intensity to them. Like, you know, first it's Jason, however, and uh, Titus Welliver are both very good actors. And even the guy, you know, the the character's name I, escapes um, me, but the Humphreys villain, essentially. Humphreys is the last name, I think. Yeah, Humphreys, right? The You know, the, the boss of the, of the company. Uh, Humphreys is also a pretty decent character actor in his own right, whoever that is. He's not somebody that I recognize, but you know, his, the couple of scenes he has are very good. And so there's a lot of intensity. The performances are very solid. And so, as you said, it feels like something that could take place in the seventies. Cause yeah, it's a nature run amok kind of, kind of a horror film premise. And it was written by Chris Carter. And so here's, here's the thing that where I'm starting to, you know, pick up on it because here we are. We're we're reaching the end of the first season. So there's yep. been a, a more than more than one episode uh, which have which have been written by uh, Chris Carter, and so it it made me put some things into perspective. So what you know, this episode ends not ambiguously, but it ends ominously. It mm-hmm. it sort of ends in a it it just sort of ends. It's the kind of thing where it just it's st- it ends because it has to end. And uh, I think that from whatever. Uh, angle you want to look at it, it's not necessarily a satisfying resolution. Uh, the problem is not resolved, is what I'm what I'm getting at, and it has that sort of ominous button at the end where 
you know, Mulder is like, wait, but what, you know, what are we going to, what happens if, if these things migrate or whatever, right? The scientist dude or whatever, the guy is like, that's not an option. But the implication being it, it sort of like throw your hands up in the air and like, you know, it is what it is, as a great man once said. But the thing <laughs> is that like, that comes from Chris Carter's apparent uh, deep mistrust of the government. Like I looked into that too, like he, because he grew up, you know, in in the in the Watergate, like in the post Watergate years, and so like that, he has this like deep mistrust of the government, and you know, it's obviously not unique to him, but he clearly puts it into his stories. But I do think that his determination to never really resolve things can be a little frustrating, especially yeah. when you consider that you have a story like this, which it's generally entertaining and compelling but because of the nature of it because this is a series where you know it's week to week you have adventures it isn't an apocalyptic horror movie where you can have this sort of dark ending like the thing or like the happening <laughs> or like the birds you know you 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 can't if you're doing a man against nature if you're doing the like a force of nature horror film where your villain is a force of nature so it's something that you can't control really it's something that you can't, you know, how do you stop that? You don't, you run away from it. You, you know, you, you escape it somehow, like what we brought up, you know, the birds or, or you don't, you know, like the thing or the happening or anything like that. But, but see in a television show where you have these characters week to week that they have to go on with their lives and you have to, you have to resolve it. And they've come up with a premise that is unresolvable. So uh, right down to the fact that, like, you know, you said this could be a 70s movie. I think it's a perfectly fine apocalyptic horror movie story, mm -hmm. you know, because in the climax, what ends up happening? They're stuck there in the Jeep and the fucking bugs get them and that's it. I mean, and that's that's <laughs> a logical conclusion to that story. But, you know, you can't kill your leads in, you know, the the first season of your show. So <laughs> obviously they're going to survive. But what makes that frustrating is that I don't think that this will ever come up again in the series, like ever again. Yeah, I doubt that these, much. yeah, these killer termites never get mentioned again. Like this is over for all intents and purposes. And so in my view, the fact that it can't really be over uh, makes for an interesting story, like for an interesting standalone story, but it doesn't make for a particularly satisfying segment of a you know of an episodic uh, television show that that's my that's how i felt when i got to the end of it i was like because this is the x-files and it's an episodic series of adventures i suppose it works as a standalone story and that's fine but the ending still feels like a bit of a wet fart because it's like it it, it can't end it can't be as dark as it wants to be for the story itself it can't be that dark it can't be that apocalyptic you can't kill your your heroes, but it also can't really give you an ending because the logic of the story doesn't allow for it. There's no way to really end this story. No, no, I totally get it. That that exchange he has with a scientist at the end is really good. I really like that beat. But yeah, it's one of those things where you finish the episode and it's over, and then you start thinking about, you know, all right, episode 21's next. But in the back of your mind, you're like, did they get all of the trees? Is this going to be a big problem in that area later on? What if they migrate to other trees? <laughs> right. Yeah, it, it, it's a lingering threat that lays in the back of your mind, but it's something that will never be addressed again. So on the one hand, it's, it's ominous in that regard that, you know, Mulder, didn't, Mulder and Scully didn't really take care of anything. The government didn't really take care of anything. This is going to be an ongoing problem. And I guess you could view that as, an accidental metaphor of environmental issues, but yeah, it it does let down on that end. It it'll never be addressed again. And like you said, it would work perfect as the ending of a movie, but as the ending of a series episode, it's not going to affect anything. And actually, I know we've talked about it a few times about how a lot of episodic TV back then, every episode was basically a standalone, and it didn't matter if you missed any of them or not because. The story ended. It was done, especially the non-mythology episodes that don't have definite endings. It's going to leave lingering thoughts. You're going to think about it later on. 
on down the line. You're going to wonder if these bugs are still a problem somewhere. You're going to wonder what happened to the pyrokinetic, <laughs> the kinetic that's uh, lying in a government hospital or prison somewhere. You know, you're exactly. going to wonder if a werewolf shows up in that town again in eight years. And since it's never addressed, it's for better or worse, it's a question mark at the end of a lot of these things that you're never really going to get any sort of resolution to, which in some cases works for the particular subject for that episode, and in other cases it doesn't work as well. And in this one, it leans towards the latter. Right. That's, that, that is exactly my point. And that, yeah, I kind of had a question. I wanted to make sure I got this right. I mean, I'm assuming that the reason, because again, here, here we go again with my whole thing about pregnant moments. I'm assuming that the reason that this happens now is because the logging company chopped down those particular trees. Yeah. Like by it, doing it, that, they released this, you know, this swarm. The, the implication is that either that one tree or maybe a couple like it had these things embedded within it, which were mostly just, I think Scully points out the fact that it's eating the dead wood must, just as much as it's eating any of the live rings like the ranger talks about. So I guess it was just feeding on the tree. And then when they cut it open, it just open season on everything around them. Right. Whereas it, I guess it would have been at least to that point content to stay in the tree until someone chopped it down or it was struck by lightning or falls over on its own and then everybody's fucked. And this had happened before, right? Like in the 30s or something? Yeah, it looked like that, yeah. Right. And so you go, okay, in the 30s, but what happened to those? Like, what happened to that swarm? Did they find another tree? Did they... Must have. You know, so, so that's the thing. It, that there are a couple of little ambiguities there because, again, I think these are things that, you know, the writers don't always think about. And whatever. I mean, the, the, I think the goal ultimately is just to write a good creepy story, a good unsettling kind of sci-fi horror story. And yes, I think this is speaking to, you, you call it an accidental metaphor. I don't know if it's necessarily accidental. I mean, I think it is trying to make a commentary about um, the environment and how we are careless with it. And oh, yeah. And, you know, and and we are careless and we don't consider these things. And so every, every single story that has this sort of bent to it is always coming from that place. Uh, you know, even the birds uh, made at a time when maybe people didn't generally think about these things as much as they did in the 90s. You know, so it works on that level. And that's what I mean. It's But it's just frustrating that because of the nature of the story... You almost you, you feel like Chris Carter gets these really good ideas for movies, I guess, or for stories. And he's got this this avenue in which to tell them, which is The X-Files. But The X-Files ultimately is an episodic television show. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that he, he said, I, I want to tell all these stories that are creepy and I want to explore different paranormal ideas and sci-fi ideas and all of that stuff. And he doesn't always think about whether that works for epi for the episodic format or not, I don't think he really cares. He figures that it will, like he just figures a way to make it work. And you know, I, I think that it doesn't always work. And you know, it's it's a, it's just an element of it. But yeah, but this episode, one thing that I also like besides the performances, yeah, I also really like the atmosphere. I think they 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 made it out in the woods, and reportedly it was a difficult production. A, a very difficult production because it involved a lot of location shooting. Like they really went out in the woods, you know, somewhere in Canada and it wasn't cause it was, it was thought of to be kind of a bottle episode. The idea was to have most of it take place in one location and to sort of save costs and just do kind of a simple thing. But it ended up being one of the more complicated episodes of the season to to produce because of all these complications and there was apparently a lot of tension on set like uh the director joe napolitano uh this is the final episode of the series that he directs because he i think he stormed off the set or something <laughs> you can tell it was a problem because there's a couple of dialogue sequences where it's raining but it's not movie or tv rain 
where they turn on the rain machine and it's got 10 times as much actual rain as you would have, so it'll show up on film. You can hear it, but you can't see it as well, which tells me that it wasn't supposed to be raining when they shot the scene, and also that it was raining so much that they didn't have time to reshoot the scene when it wasn't raining. I mean, I, I do think that in one way that it helped, yeah. maybe, that the tension on the set might have helped make the tension in the episode more real. Yeah. I, I think the actors really tapped into it because there is a lot of tension. I think that, I mean, the episode is not as good, obviously, but I think that the last time that things were like this was in ice. Yeah. Where there's this moment of genuine tension between Mulder and Scully. And at some point, you know, Scully starts to lose it also. She, she, she begins to lose her, her, her composure because they're now in a desperate situation. So it has a very similar uh, level of tension to it. And I, I would imagine that uh, the difficult, the complicated uh, circumstances helped in a way. And it's ironic because those are the things that actually make the episode better. I think that the episode doesn't quite hold together, but because it has these elements of genuine tension, of very strong performances and all of that stuff. I think because of it, it elevates the episode. It, ter it turns what is kind of a middle of the road episode into a slightly better one because the good qualities are very good. Yeah, I agree. Of course, the Ranger, the eco-terrorist and the logging company boss are at each other's throats throughout as they would be. And then you toss them all, plus Mulder and Scully, into this dangerous scenario where if they wander out at night without any light around them, they're going to get devoured. But they're also too far away from civilization to just hoof it on out off the mountain without it hitting dark before they even get halfway there. So they're kind of screwed unless someone comes along to rescue them. So that makes it even more tense. And then there's the simple fact that Mulder ends up trusting Doug, Titus Welliver's character, more than anyone else does, and lets him run off with a vehicle and gasoline. Yeah, that, that's that's a good scene. That, that's one of the scenes that I was talking about where the um, the tension between yeah. the company and the guy from Monkey Shines, um, the tension between them is very genuine. You know, these are these are two actors who are friends off screen, and so when they have to play a scene together, they can sort of really have fun, you know, tapping into... The energy that they can tap into as actors and so when that's just a great scene you know when he comes out and goes like oh you what well, wait a minute you're you know he he laughed <laughs> what oh you gave him the gas you just you know oh you just trusted his word like oh you you know it's really oh okay yeah. it's like the guy who's been sabotaging all the stuff around here i think you just you decided that you were going to trust him with our lives and you're like, that, that That scene's actually really good. Turn the generator back on. I got the radio. It might work now. No, I don't want the gas to run out at 2 a.m. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Congratulations. You may have just killed us all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's uh, – that. and then, you know, and I do like how after that, so Mulder kind of walks away with, with his tail between his legs, and he's genuinely apologetic about it. It's like he, he acknowledges that he, he may have fucked up. Yeah, there, you know, there's a thing where he's like, "Yeah, maybe this, you know, I, I just might have fucked us." But he's more like, "All right, but stop getting on my case about it, right? I, yeah, I, I get it. I fucked up. Right, you know, uh, that's kind of how it is. He's apologetic, but also like, "All right, enough. Get off my back. I, I know I fucked up. I feel, I feel terrible about it. But what are you gonna do?" But th those are the things about the episode that uh, th that give it enough energy to make it very enjoyable to watch even if it's not entirely satisfying. Because that, that was sort of the thing that, that I found, that as it started, it took a minute to grab me because of the fact that I don't give a shit about the logging industry. And, <laughs> and, and, so, and something about that cold open was like, oh, it's a bunch of lumberjacks, and they're in the woods, and these bugs come. And, and I was sort of sitting there settling, down, settling in for an episode that it was already kind of pushing me away. You know, it, it was, it didn't start in a way that really grabbed me. I thought, well, what, what is this? Like, uh, it took a minute, you know, I, and I think it wasn't until, uh, 
the ranger showed up and it wasn't until that happened it's not until they they really start with the investigation until that great scene where they discover the cocoon and there's like a mummified corpse inside it and yeah. scully's face like when she's like oh, hanging yeah. on that tree and when she sees those like rotting fingers and just like her her face you almost wonder if it was something it feel it seems really genuine it's almost like maybe jillian anderson didn't realize what she was going to see and maybe her reaction was was kind of like yeah this is gross and like it really like registered on camera in a genuine way but um that's when i started to say okay fine and that's like maybe 10 minutes into the episode like it has kind of a slow start that that's a fun moment because uh my daughter was in the room when i was watching that particular bit they they spot the cocoon and the next scene they're hoisting scully up in the air and her response was why does she have to go up and do it and i said well honey she's smaller so they probably figured they could lift her easier than they could Mulder or you know the ranger she said well i don't care that's not fair i wouldn't go up there <laughs> and, and judging from scully's look on her face she doesn't want to be up there either and even less once she realizes what's poking out of the side of that cocoon <laughs> yeah and it's like right in her face too and it's like ew gross and it probably stinks too so it's oh, like oh god yeah it's fine. It doesn't really take off until that moment. But then once that happens, and once they're stuck in the woods, and you have that great scene when they, when they, once they have Titus Wellever, they go to the cabin. They're all sort of, they have this argument, and then it grabs you. Then like you, then you sort of get invested in these particular characters because the actors have brought them to life in a in a good, compelling way. So. Then the episode finally does pick up and becomes very enjoyable. But as I said, because of the nature of the story they're telling, it can never truly resolve itself in a satisfying way. When I, when I said that metaphor was accidental, I, I only meant on the part of the environmental angle of it being an ongoing problem. Because while I'm sure that was lingering in the back of Chris Carter's mind, his focal point at the end seems to be that Hey, Mulder, the government is going to stand here and lie to you that everything is going to be fine no matter what when it's clearly not. This is going to be an ongoing problem because they are lying and what they do is lying and they will always lie and these problems will always crop back up and blow up in their face. So he's leaning more on not really on the conspiracy angle, but I guess the uh, the hubris of government and even science to a degree, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is that, you know, it's, it's this, uh, his eternal mistrust in the government, as, mm -hmm. as has been stated, that feeds into it. And, right, it's ultimately the point that the episode is trying to make about how the government is lying to you and all of that. It's fine, but again, for the story, I guess it's the, it's the only ending it could have had as an X-Files episode. Unfortunately, it couldn't have ended any other way. Like it couldn't have ended any other way, and I think that they were counting on that ominous button to be enough. <laughs> and I'm just not sure if it is quite enough. That's that's really my only my only point there. Come to All think right. of it, there is one more ending they could have had, and it ties back into your other podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What do we do if the bugs come out? Oh, we'll just get this special type of lizard, and they can eat the bugs. What if the lizards overrun the forest? Oh, we'll get this special type of gorilla that loves to eat those lizards. What about the gorillas? Oh, they'll die in the winter. I can't right. remember which it's... Simpsons episode that was, but yeah, that's that's literally the only other way you could end it. Yeah, exactly. It's like a, well, it, and in a sense, that is exactly what how it ends. You know, kind it, of, it, yeah, it, kind of. it sort of, it sort of ends in a well, oh well. <laughs> I think it ultimately comes down to it being the. The adventure of uh, the adventure of Mulder and Scully in the woods, and mm -hmm. how are they going to get out of it? Yeah. Okay, if we want to be honest, if we if we just want to look at it as a horror movie about these people who are stuck in a cabin in the woods and they need to get out of there because there's this swarm of of you know killer fireflies, um, mm -hmm. and so they need to you know they need to run away. And so what happens in the end? Well, they almost run away you know titus welliver gets eaten up and you know and then they like they're stuck in that jeep and luckily they're saved yeah. you know i mean but but it's like we showed up just in time if we'd taken maybe an, a half hour longer scully would probably not be alive right now so so it's like it has the sort of thing where 
I guess another thing about it that's a little bit frustrating is that the protagonists don't do anything. You know, they they get lucky. That's basically what it is. They get lucky. And and that's what I meant by that's I guess that's why it's not so satisfying. Because if you have this story that's about an investigation, et cetera, et cetera, but if the resolution basically happens by chance, that can never be satisfying. Not not for not for a series of adventures where you have these protagonists who you follow week to week. And so it's either they're going to solve the case, they're going to crack the case, or they're not going to crack the case. They're going to get the bad guy, or they're not going to get the bad guy. They're going to, you know, save the day, or they're not going to save the day. But but if it's what's going to happen, well, they're going to get stuck in the Jeep, and, you know, they're, they're fucked. At the end, they're fucked. <laughs> but, you know, because this is the X-Files and they can't die, we'll, we'll have somebody save them in the nick of time, and that's how the episode will end. And that's, that's why you're like, eh. And, and if that were a movie, that would be a terrible ending for a movie. I mean, for it to end like that. If, you know? uh, if it were a movie, it would have ended with a shot of them being cocooned and dead. Yeah. Like black. <laughs> Done. Yeah. Yeah, basically that. Or, or, just, I mean, or like, there you go. This ends. Like, the ending of this episode is the tacked on, like, TV ending that they sure. had John Carpenter. They had John Carpenter shoot like a like a quote unquote happy ending for the thing that shows Kurt Russell getting saved or something. Yeah. Him, him taking a blood test and they actually share the test coming back negative. Right. Or something like that, you know, but, but basically the implication is he was rescued yeah. from the, from, you know, and I guess the implication is that, you know, Keith David is dead. And so he gets rescued and, but that's like, eh, you know, that, that's a terrible yeah. way. The way the thing ends, that's how the thing has to end. You tack on an ending like this, ugh, you know. So, so yeah, I guess, I guess that's what it is. It's like, like this would be a great horror movie. Uh, great characters. The idea of it is creepy and everything, and it would even be kind of cool that it has this apocalyptic dark ending. And but then if you th if you tack on this kind of wet fart, you kind of deflate the whole thing. So you know, it's uh, I I can I, again I give it points for all the good the stuff that it gets right. It gets enough right that, you know, it's fine. Yeah, the, the acting pulls it away from being something as forgettable as the Salamander Hand episode or, you know, a couple of the others that we've come across as time goes on. Shadows yeah. is the, the one that doesn't really stick out. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's as we've said repeatedly, when you have a season full of, when you have a season of 20, 24 episodes, and to be fair, you know, a handful of those are going to be middling. Yeah. And this one manages to be a little better than middling thanks to the good qualities that it has. Our entomologists are still trying to determine the specific epithet of the insects you encountered. How's she doing? She's still not out of the woods, so to speak. She lost a lot of fluids. Two or three more hours of exposure. She might not have made it. I told her it was going to be a nice trip to the forest. How are you going to contain it to the forest? What if the swarm migrates? The government has initiated eradication procedures. They're quite certain that by using a combination of controlled burns and pesticides, they will be successful. And if they're not? That is not an option, Mr. Mulder. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed our discussion. And if you did, please subscribe to the podcast, give us a like, take a minute to write a positive review, and go ahead and spread the word on social media. The podcast is available on Anchor FM, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other platforms. Look for the Eric Antoine Network on Facebook or on YouTube. You can also follow me on Twitter at Eric's Antoine Net and check out my film reviews on Letterboxd. You should also check out Daniel Baldwin's website, theschlocketeer.com, and follow him on Twitter at Daniel W. Baldwin. I'm Eric Santuan, and I'll be back in a few days when Daniel and I will discuss the return of Victor Tombs. And I hope you'll join us for that landmark event. Until then, let's all remember that the truth is out there. See you next time.